I caught indigenous microorganisms using nine different grains as a food source. And what I found really Whoa. surprised me. Traditionally, white rice is considered the best food source for catching IMO. But as I've developed my natural gardening craft, I've come to realize that while rice may be the traditional choice, it may not be the best choice for every grower. So in this video, I'm gonna walk you through how I used nine different grains to catch indigenous microbes, what I discovered by doing so, and why sticking to rice for your IMO-1 may be holding you back from more effective and sustainable approaches to Korean natural farming. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Korean natural farming or KNF, it's a framework for agriculture that relies on homemade and localized gardening inputs, namely, and most importantly, IMO. And if you've never heard of IMO, you may wanna check out our beginner's breakdown video where I cover my personal discovery of how this process really works. It's a truly incredible way to upgrade your gardening game, but there lies a problem with KNF, and that is that almost all of the recipes are reliant on ingredients that are native and abundant in, you guessed it, Korea, meaning some of the ingredients could be grown in other parts of the world, but certainly not 100% of them. For example, OHN, Oriental Herbal Nutrient, is a KNF input that extracts nutrients and compounds from herbs like ginger, garlic, licorice, and angelica root, which can all technically be grown in my zone, zone 6B. But it also uses cinnamon bark extract, which grows best in tropical and subtropical climates, very different to mine. So when it comes to KNF's most important input, IMO, it begs the question, if IMO1 in Korea grows best on white rice, what does IMO1 grow on best in North America? And even more specifically in Washington state, even in Eastern Washington state, which is quite a bit different than Western Washington. Now I've been able to capture IMO1 on white rice in my area, but since rice is primarily, if not completely imported from other countries, is it the most sustainable and readily available option? In other words, if I were to try to grow all of my own inputs, I would not be able to grow rice easily in my dry climate. And so ironically, while most of KNF practitioners swear by rice for everyone, rice is simply not going to be the best natural option for everyone. Earlier this year, I read a book by Rene Redzepi called The Noma Guide to Fermentation. And it talks about making koji, a fungal inoculant used in traditional Japanese cuisine, out of pearl barley rather than the traditional short grain white rice. While they were open, the Noma restaurant focused on utilizing locally grown food while excluding imported crops for creating their dishes. As I looked at the pictures in this book, the process for making koji looked strangely familiar. So it got me thinking, what would happen if I tried a different grain for an IMO collection? Now I'm sure people have tried this and please comment on this video if you have, but I couldn't find much on the internet about people's experiences trying out different grains for IMO1. So I ran an experiment. I set up four IMO1 collection boxes with four different types of grain. One carried my usual cooked short grain white rice, one carried a long grain white rice, a long grain brown rice, and then in the last one I cooked pearl barley. And I took these boxes to the mountainous region closest to my growing area, found an ideal collection site, lots of visible mycelium, good earthy smells, and away from any potential human disturbance. Left these boxes for one week with outdoor temperatures fluctuating between 50 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And after I went to retrieve the boxes, I brought them home and cracked them open. Surprisingly, the most robust biological bloom and the least contaminated collection came from the box carrying pearl barley. In fact, this was one of the best collections I had gotten all season. And to clarify, for a good collection of IMO, I'm looking for clean, mostly white hyphae that holds together the grains and forms a structure that sort of resembles thick cotton candy. What was fascinating to me was that even though I placed the rice boxes in almost the exact same location, the white rices both became contaminated with yellow, green, blue, and pink molds, and the brown rice did second best to the barley. The gray-black that you see on top of the barley and the brown rice collections is not a black mold or a contamination. This is perfectly normal since dust particles will inevitably get in and accumulate a little bit on the surface of the grains in the boxes. So this got me thinking. What would other grains produce? So here I am with another box of barley along with five other grains. We've got millet, oats, buckwheat, regular wheat, and rye. We're gonna take these out into the forest. I'm gonna take them out with my friend Tyson and we're gonna look for some nice collection spots, some good mycelium development in the soil and other signs of biological activity. We're gonna leave them for probably a little bit shorter time, probably four to five days because it's a bit hotter now. So here we go. I set off to find a collection site with my good friend Tyson, 
and we found an incredible collection site crawling with fungal hyphae. We buried our boxes and got out of there quick because we were getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. And then seven days later, I returned and scooped up my precious cargo and headed back home. Every time you pick up these boxes, it's a bit of an unknown. You don't know exactly what you're gonna get in your collection box. All right, I just got back from the forest with my boxes and I'm gonna crack them open. I'm really interested to see if there's any notable difference between grain to grain for our collections. All right, so starting with box number one, we've got millet. Whoa. Whoa. So right away I can tell that we got a, a collection. It looks black, but it's actually just a gray. You can see there's dust particles on the top. This is a solid collection, looks like very cotton candy-like. There's, there's also a, some dew that is starting to settle and kind of form on there. So now we'll go on to box number two, which is containing our wheat berries. Wow, very different collection already. Oh my goodness, that's so cool. <laughs> that's just wild how different it is. Right away I can tell the grains are clearly inoculated and I see maybe a little bit of blue in there, but otherwise there's less fungal bloomage coming over the top than the millet and it's stayed relatively in there. I think let's move on to box number three, which is our rye. And I'm expecting this one will be somewhat similar to the farro wheat. Wow, wow, very interesting. Okay, actually completely different <laughs> than the wheat. That actually looks like a great collection. It's got a great amount of white and gray fuzz over the top. I mean, obviously we'll get a better idea as we dig into each of these. Looks like a solid collection from the rye berries there. Isn't that cool? This is like already a success for me. I'm like, cause they all look different. That's wild. <laughs> Next up, we've got the oats and an incredible collection again. I mean, wow, this is, this is really wild. It's actually really interesting to see how they've peeled away from the edges of the box. And you can see there's fungal bloom just still clinging or whatever biology it is that's just clinging to the side of the box. Looks like a solid collection. The dew has certainly settled on it. Probably would have been even better if we'd like, if we'd opened it up in the forest and preserved it with brown sugar, but this is totally fine. This is so cool. <laughs> this is like my favorite video that we've done so far. <laughs> okay, next up we've got the toasted buckwheat. Interested to see this one again. Pretty different look, wow. It's kind of similar to the oats. I guess, but really interesting. It almost looks like snow at first glance. It's like a, or like a frosted window. That's crazy. I mean, they smell different. <laughs> it's an incredible asset to have a documented collection. And last up, we've got our barley, pearl barley, and another just really cool, interesting collection. That is fascinating how much moisture has condensed. There's like a pool of liquid that's, I'm assuming just the dew coming off of this. So this is probably the best collection, the barley again, but all very interesting. We're gonna take these out and then we'll get them preserved in brown sugar as soon as possible. It's like so warm, it's crazy. So it does have some contamination in there, that's all right. That's crazy warm. It's like pretty mushy. Well, the oats might actually be the best. It'll, it'll all depend on when we crack into it. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of contamination, but like actually not that bad for that. All right, so I've got the best collections after kind of pulling them apart and starting to get the brown sugar to draw out the moisture of the microbes and the grains. I'm gonna jar them up into these jars. I've got my label maker, which is really handy for moments like this. I've got the grain that was used to catch the microorganisms. And then I've got the date that they were collected. After having pulled apart all of the IMO collections. I still think that barley is actually probably the best performer, but oats is gonna be a close second. And it honestly, like I would use them interchangeably probably. It's just if I had the option, maybe barley, but the oats feel very good with. I just pulled out the best bits and I filled up a whole jar of IMO too. I'm gonna jar up the rest of these collections and the moisture is gonna come out of them and all of that. Top four, barley, oats, buckwheat, and millet.
Now it's worth mentioning that while I did a I did perform a side-by-side -side comparison with these grains, this is not really able to be considered a fully legitimate experiment because it's possible that with different ways of preparing the grains, cooking them for different lengths of time, I might get different results. For each of these grains, I just kept the preparation conditions as similar as possible. For each of them, I gave them a thorough rinsing until all the excess starch was washed off, similar to how I prepare white rice for IMO1. And then I cooked two cups of each in two cups of water for 20 minutes. The only exception to this was when I cooked the wheat and rye. These were taking a lot longer to absorb the water and cook through, so I let them go for closer to 50 minutes. It's also totally possible and even likely that IMO takes longer or shorter to culture on each of these food sources. So as you're considering which grains you might like to give a go, Keep all of that in mind. Start with the grains that are grown in your area already, since these may have the best chance overall of capturing the local IMOs. Overall, I'm thrilled with my findings. I'll probably be sticking to barley and oats from here on out, unless I hear otherwise. I had a great time with this experiment. If you did too, or you found something helpful, please drop a comment, like this video, share it with someone who might benefit from it as well. And if you want to get my breakdown of how to collect perfect IMO every time, you're going to want to check out this video next.